thank you so much for joining us today for the final webinar uh, presentation. This one is a big one, just like last week, we saved the best for last, partnerships and tips for a successful application. My name is Deanne Cuellar. I'm the Associate Director of Community Outreach for the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. We are going to go on to the agenda. Next slide. Uh, today, apart from welcomes and introductions, we are going to hear from Cindy Fisher with the Texas Broadband Development Office. We'll be covering collaborative partnerships and the importance for collaboration. I want you to walk away from today's presentation with tips for successful applications, and that we'll reserve the practical application group discussion Q&A for the end. And then we'll also be telling you about some series of feedback that uh, y'all will be engaging with uh, post webinar. So this is this is the last presentation, but this is not at the end of us working together in advancing our digital opportunity goals. So let me hand it over to Cindy for a moment. Thanks, Deanne. Um, okay, so first and foremost, I just wanna say thank you all um, so much for each and every one of you that have been attending these webinars over the course of the last nine weeks. Um, this has been the BDO's intention for quite some time to be able to convene and provide um, additional educational capacity and support as we're moving into sort of implementation phase, right, for all of the digital opportunity planning. Um, we have learned so much over the course of the last nine weeks, both from your feedback, the discussion questions you've asked, um, the feedback that ISLR and HRNA have been able to provide to us. And I can't thank you enough for having the space to show up and um, ask great questions, learn. And that's hugely uh, thank you to ISLR's work in really building in a really important um, methodology to sharing the very like um, just a, a really common sense approach to this very large topic that many of us are, are really investigating for the first time. So I just want to give a big thanks to ISLR and to HRNA for the work that they've done on this um, on this uh, webinar series. And I also want to say is, you know, just to kind of echo what Deanne just said, is that this is the beginning. We're laying the groundwork. As you all know, this is the first time that Texas has done, um, created a, a cohesive, collaborative, statewide approach to digital opportunity. So um, we ask you to think about this in terms of a marathon, not a sprint. We're gonna keep coming back to you for your comments and your feedback and your collaboration. So um, this might be the last webinar, but it's not the end. So just stay tuned. And um, if you haven't already, please sign up for our newsletter um, and reach out to us at digital.opportunity at cpa.texas.gov. Um, that's really all I had to say. Uh, Deanne and team, thank you so much. Um, again, I'm really excited for our last session today. And if there's anything else that you all um, Please continue to be so engaging throughout the, the last session and we'll, let's let's keep learning. Back to you, Thank Deanne. You. Thank you so much, Cindy. So before I go to my next slide, before we go to the next slide, just know when we're asking questions about this topic, you know, the, there are lots of people um, in the chat who have years of experience doing this kind of work. So please like, if please engage with each other in the chat, like answer each other's questions, like help each other out. This is the resource sharing part. Um, also like, you know, Deanne's way is not the only way, you know, this, I've come from a community organizer background. So to, to give you context, like I approach proposals and working with an organization or a government, like as a community organizer, but that we're going to talk about the different players and that um, that work also on um, on these types of projects to consider other types of stakeholders and decision makers and leaders. Really, anybody who wants to do digital inclusion work, if they want to do it, they should do it. Next slide. So you remember the um, the way I described the three legs of the stool um, in a previous presentation. So. When we define a, an effective partnership, effective partnerships have some of the same moving pieces. Um, a good partnership and with a program is, is highly engaging with the community, like not just like leaders of organizations and um, decision makers, but actually like the folks who are most impacted 
buying issue. There's resource sharing um, and there's measurable outcomes like, you know, starting from, you know, one child without a computer to 200 children with a computer. And so when we talked about the three things that make up closing the digital divide last week, wanted to put it all together from uh, the last presentation. So we talked about fast and reliable internet connectivity. That is the beyond the classroom project where they're trying to connect households with routers over on um, devices connected to high speed internet. Those are devices, right, that are going to deploy or fly out to the community that could be connecting to that internet. And we know that school districts involved. And then digital skills, like that's um, that's an in-person community uh, technology center, commonly called a CTC or tech lab, it doesn't really matter, neighborhood center, where uh, someone in the community can go to get instruction with a digital navigator and other types of digital skills learning also in, in, um, involved like tech support. Um, I talked about how like a senior that can't leave their home, you know, we might have to call them and talk them through. So this is what it looks like when it's all together. Next slide. Um, examples of successful partnerships, um, they build over time. So I want to leave you with today that, you know, in the beginning, there might be just five people, a lot of uh, five people could accomplish a lot. And then tomorrow there could be more. This is uh, the picture on the left is, um, you know, pre-COVID. This was uh, my first graduating class of Senior Planet Older Adults. It, I think it maybe had like five to eight people, but to bring five to eight people through an eight week long program that met twice a week was was um, was a learning um, process. And then how did we reach people like over time, we wanted 15 navigators, we wanted to reach more people. Um, this picture in the middle is we actually went out into the community and we started asking people beyond the senior center, where are older adults? And um, older adults, um, you know, they have routines just like we do. And so this is a like a nice picture of how we actually went to like one of the favorite restaurants in a neighborhood where hundreds of older adults were going there, not only to eat and hang out, but using the free Wi-Fi of this restaurant. And so here we recruited more. And then this last picture to the right, I really wanna share this because during COVID, it wasn't just, um, it wasn't just older adults and K through 12 students that were impacted. There are lots of us, um, lots of us on this call and lots of people who are not here today, um, people of all ages uh, volunteer their time on committees and boards and things out in their community and all of that backbone that helps our community run will also transition to COVID. So here is a really nice picture of the Child Welfare Board in Bear County after they got all of their uh, board members upskilled with digital literacy and got them devices and gotten connected to the internet and they were able to carry out their governing process. Next slide. So we're gonna talk about different kinds of partnerships. Um, they, I want you to I also want you to consider that you can you can um, outline a program or a partnership and it if it's if it's not a fit at the time, it doesn't mean that like it has to be started from fresh. It could be something that you went out into the community with a solution and you found out something from engaging with the community or researching with the community or some sort of knowledge exchange that like a model might need to change. And so you come back and you adapt it. Um, a, a really, I'm gonna put like a really strong stamp on offering this is consider healthcare partnerships for telehealth initiatives. One of the reasons why we shared with you our telehealth um, report and online calculator is that if you want to quantify the cost of doing nothing, this area um, on top, like also including workforce development and other areas, but healthcare partnerships and telehealth initiatives are really strong areas um, that the community can get involved and get creative. So I mentioned here this UTSA 15 week digital nutrition information intervention research, it's a mouthful. But if you look over here on the right, um, what happened here is a UTSA, some people from the medical sector, some people who do digital skills, people who do um, you know, social determinants of health intervention and research all came together and said, this is the piece I bring to this digital divide. This is the reciprocity I need, meaning like what's, what, what does a researcher get out of it? Well, if a researcher is trying to find people impacted by a social determinant of health, outside of the hospital system they're going to need the community engages with those people so they did a they did a wonderful 
partnership with a 15 week program that combined federal funding and local resources and a combination of collaborators to, to help them achieve their goal. And it had a huge um, impact. And I'll give you an example of another one, um, you know, that, you know, you can look into um, being creative. I think I mentioned this one of being creative, like Methodist Healthcare Ministries, Jewish Family Services of San Antonio, and the, um, you know, what happened in Uvalde, they, you know, they, they um, found a way to talk to each other and go out there and talk about like what, what the digital divide um, currently it might be doing to their community or what maybe is like, um, you know, after disaster hits a community like that, are there, um, there are other solutions that can be implemented as the community is recovering? So we are, I remind people, we are in pandemic recovery. That's where these federal funds come from. So be thinking about all sorts of ways that you could be helping your community um, during this time and what these dollars were designed to do, the funding was designed to do. Next slide. Um, also be thinking um, outside of um, your comfort zone. When it, we'll, we'll get into this a little bit later, but like what we talked about last week, actually like these harder, these harder to reach populations, veterans, um, people who English is not their first language, um, really like when people look at the numbers of the communities impacted by this issue, they'll look at it and be like, so 12% are impacted or 6% are impacted. One of the things to remember is that like those numbers might seem low, but those also are high in the sense that they are the hardest to reach populations. So collaboration is key with any program. And so this is an example of how, um, you know, people who are seriously involved with, when I say backbone of the community, it's like these are the organizations serving the community. In Power in Harris County got a $1.8 million um, project to train uh, veterans and young people. It's a cohesive plan that not only involves the, the uh, device, it involves the training, but it also involves like the workforce development component of helping these fine um, longstanding, um, sorry, I got distracted by a chat, longstanding um, jobs in their community after they went through the training. So it's like all three, right? Um, and then I like to point to the uh, PSJA ISD school board agreement with the city of FAR. It wasn't just the city of FAR, you know, and the kids that were getting computers or access to the internet, but there actually was like an agreement with this, like multiple cities that the school district. So not to get into today, but like they're already thinking through what their community is going to do post ACP because they designed their the solution in anticipation that that program might not, not be around. Next slide. Um, the community-based partnership model, um, I want you to consider these questions when you're building your community-based partnership model. I'm calling it a community-based partnership model because if it's community-based partnerships, that it will be more successful for an application or for funding um, around this issue. How will you engage uh, with the community that you want to work with is going to be key. So be thinking about like how, are, like if you were to deploy a thousand devices connected to the internet to reach veterans, how will you engage those communities, that community specifically? Are you going to co-design that solution with an organization that works directly with veterans? Or if you are the organization that works directly with, um, with veterans, you maybe have that covered. Um, does your program model center cover populations? If it doesn't, well, you know, you would probably want to revisit the uh, the Tdap and the cover populations in the plan because that's what the plan was designed to do. So you want to make sure that you're including um, these cover populations. I I've, I've been um, offering for people to consider more than one because cover populations intersect with each other. Does your plan align with Tdap's five goals? It should focus on aligning with Tdop's five goals first before you add other goals, right? So it should have more of the Tdop goals and less of new goals. The Tdop goals are not just like the goals that were pulled out of thin air. These are goals that uh, that other communities are using. They align with what other states are considering. They aligns nationally and locally and statewide with what people want to see as it relates to digital opportunity planning. And you always want to make sure that you have a way to evaluate your success and outcomes. And we'll get into that more. 
Next slide. Consider programs, proposals, and solutions you're designing for hard to reach communities, as I mentioned before. Um, veterans, this is not all of them, but like veterans, um, English, English as a second language, uh, justice impacted families. What that means is incarcerated individuals, formerly incarcerated, the families of those individuals, all ages, um, rural and frontier rural, there's a difference. Um, I actually learned that through uh, this uh, process with you all, but rural and frontier rural, those are gonna be hard to reach communities. Um, and there's not a lot about this, but tribal communities is one of um, the hard to reach communities. Um, there are both um, rural, urban and rural um, tribal communities. So be considering that. You got a nice little picture here from the Bridging Apps program where they had a veterans and iPad uh, solution that was pretty successful, it reached a lot of people. So tailored solutions, um, the device recommendations, the connectivity speeds are the right, the skills are tailored to the uh, community that it's going to reach. Next slide. I could, this one I cannot stress more, <laughs> that I think I've been a broken record about this uh, throughout the whole series, but the TDOP cohorts and working groups, if a cohort does, uh, doesn't exist, I'm, I'm um, asking you to consider forming one. Don't go alone. Uh, don't be a single organization that wants to do this alone. Um, working groups, uh, if you are part of a working group right now, um, if you don't know if you, um, what working group you should join, we've provided a QR code. Uh, you can use this QR code or the link, and then you can put in the area and you can find out the, the long list of people or the short list of people that are, you know, uh, working as a working group right now through the TDOT planning or you, one you can join or sit in. Um, and the benefits of that, amplified impact. The proposal quality, right? You, like that I mentioned before, like I did not have the expertise of Dr. Sarah Ulaveg um, at UTSA Health Science Center, right? So I had, but I offered my part of the proposal. How are we gonna reach the community? How are we gonna market the plan? What language was it going to, the curriculum gonna be designed in? So, but having um, having Dr. Ulaveg participate in the proposal process, we added a, um, a compelling argument about measuring the outcomes and she had a theory of what technology could do um, for them impacted seniors. Um, and increased capacity. Um, you have, when more people work together, you have the expertise of other people working together. You have their capacity that they bring to the table. And as mentioned before, um, it's wonderful to be able to share resources and it's wonderful to be able to engage with the community. And that comes from people working together um, on this issue. I've, I'll just tell you from working with you all last few weeks, I've seen an uptick um, in emails um, and phone calls and text messages of people sharing resources saying, oh, I have that, or hey, we have a template, or hey, we started that, um, and people uh, finding new ways to engage with each other to share flyers and so on. Next slide. Um, a, sex, a successful application um, will uh, will be reflected that when the when a, a, a grant, the grant maker or whoever the BDO is going to set up to review the proposals. They can read in, um, in your document that you have an understanding of the TDOP. So remember, TDOP is the document. You want a familiarity and understanding of what's in that document, which is why we've gone through it so many um, different ways. And they're the first two webinars, you can reflect back on those to look at what's in there and find the page numbers um, through the different tables. The Digital Opportunity Program is the entity providing the funds. So those are the two differences. And again, a reminder of the alignment with the TDOP goals. Next slide. Um, key components of a successful application um, will have that community partnership model questions answered, but also like these are very common areas than a proposal that you could be putting together. So one of the things that we're really urging people to do during this period where we know February 8th, nobody can, no, no longer can apply for the ACP program. We know that uh, when that program, if it's not refunded, one out of six households in the United States will no longer have that subsidy. So we know that. So we can start today knowing that in November that um, a, um, a grant making entity will form and be open sometime in November, fall 2024, 
These are questions that we can start working on now by pulling together a working group or a cohort. What are the resources that we need? If, if one out of six households in um, your county are about to lose their ACP resources, what they might need access to high-speed internet, what activities will you need to do to reach all of the five goals? Um, if you're gonna, if you're deciding to work with a specific covered population or more, you you might want to outline what those activities look like. The activity for reaching a family with K through 12 students is going to look different than reaching um, an older adult with living with disabilities in a frontier rural community. Um, how we measure success, um, the outputs, like like I mentioned before, like it's just not about getting like a hundred devices and just waiting for someone to come check them out or you know how you don't want those resources to sit unused. Um, you want to make sure that you've thought out like how those devices are going to get out of the community, how are they going to be used, how are they going to be maintained, how are they going to be managed, how much they're going to cost to go on. Um, and your outcomes and your impacts. You know, how will you be helping us reach um, those goals? Like what are the long-term impacts? So for example, one long-term impact could be um, X number of students who come through a workforce development solution, um, this many students achieve employment for a certain amount of time, and there, there are others, or the cost of healthcare um, goes down for a specific population that um, has used a longstanding telehealth solution. Um, there are many more, and these are not real examples. These are just common examples that, that you can build on. Um, and there are models out there that you can read about, oodles of them. Next slide. Clearly define your program. Um, if someone's looking at your proposal and they have more questions about what you're trying to accomplish, it would be um, it would be like a red flag. You, Use trusted people within your organization and outside your organization to, to read how you define your program. Um, we do that here at ILSR. I, you know, uh, we have different expertise. We have a research team, a comms team, and a community outreach team. So I will often write something and ask the research team, like, do you, you know, does this make sense to you? You know, you know, from a research perspective, you know, is this viable? Um, we'll reach out to Jordan, be like, Jordan is plain language that people can understand. Clearly define your program. Um, again, the TDOP goals, if they're not in there, they need to go there. Um, and clarity addressing covered populations needs as found in the TDOP, the needs assessment section. Um, if you say you're going to work with a covered population and you're, it does, there's not enough clarity around how you're going to do that, um, you might want to revisit. For example, to, to give you a tip about where this might come in, often, um, Practitioners in this space ha like have a device in mind that they think is a device that goes with a specific digital skills program. Um, and often the digital skills programming, the one you choose, is designed for a specific audience. And then that audience might need a different device than what's anticipated. Um, so it's often... If you choose multiple types of curriculum, you could have multiple types of devices. Like there is curriculum out there that's from a smartphone to a tablet to a laptop. So this is getting to the weeds, but just clarity about cover populations. Um, and the last tip about that, like if you're working with communities living with disabilities, you're gonna, it's gonna, your how your program is gonna do that is gonna be clearly defined down to like like all of the fine details of and very specifically like when you say people living with disabilities, like. It could be specific disabilities, right? There's a long list of disabilities out there and most of them have more than one. Next slide. Uh, comprehensive budgeting, this is, this is really important. Technology is not um, cheap. Even refurbished devices um, and low cost devices are expensive to the impacted communities that people were trying to reach. You. You can also determine that that is true based on the fact that 42% of the country qualified for the ACP program. So knowing that, um, I like to I like that we suggested y'all to review this uh, Digi Unity graphic that they make available because if you look at the device essentials in this, like it's more than just a device. 
like I've been mentioning, like all of these weeks, like there's a lot of things that are part of the making sure that you could do even do the three legs of the stool. And then when it comes to digital adoption, there are also resources that are needed in order to do that. So when you're developing your budget, don't just put devices, connectivity, and digital skills. You're going to want to, you know, unzip that and really uh, put in there the particulars and specifics of what you'll need in order to be successful, which is that resources column that we showed you before. Um, leveraging and diversifying the resources that are already available for maximum impact. Um, you know, the example of us going to a cafeteria instead of money, uh, spending money on marketing. Um, it was something as simple as like getting a hold of the right person and saying, hey, we noticed like 300 people are here. Um, you know, instead of us spending money on marketing, like, do we have permission to come here and enroll people? Um, or, you know, can we get an MOU to work with the 300 people that come to this uh, specific center every day instead of building a new building? Like, how about like, instead of us, you know, brick and mortar in this project, what if we came to you? Um, so that's, those are different examples. Um, another example is if you're working with a Spanish speaking community and brief created a resource and they're a partner in your program, you know, you could share, you know, the translation services um, and then aligning your budget with the funding criteria, which is TBD, but there will be guidance in the funding criteria when it's available. Next slide. Um, engage with the community. We've said this a lot, but engage and engage again. <laughs> and, then, and then engage again. Um, uh, you know, things change. When we were doing um, community feedback, Pre-COVID, it looked a lot different um, than the community engagement and activation during COVID. And then after COVID, um, it changed again. Um, and so it, it, you know, it's always revisiting the, you know, the needs and the assessment of like what's going on in the community. Um, and it, it activates them. And I always learn something new. It's also how you build trust is to get out there and talk to the community. And you can only move at this via trust, which I've brought up several times. So this, this is an interesting picture of one of um, you know, our fellows uh, who you know, does research-based work around this issue, Christina Munoz, highly recommend reading her stuff. Um, and we were doing some power mapping, you know, of the, and this one specifically, she was work, um, her working group was people uh, working with um, unhoused populations and um, communities with food insecurity. Um, so this is her giving her feedback at, at one of our in-person events. Next slide. Um, engage again, as I mentioned, uh, you know, um, the best outcomes come from people talking to one another. So this was um, an in-person meeting in San Antonio, Texas, people from across the state, across organizations, across sectors. It was crisp, crisp, cross, like so many different people from, um, you know, different viewpoints and different subject matter experts coming together for a full day to talk about like what collaboration um, means and being open to listening to each other. And also I will say that when we all got together, we did not all have the answers, but we were open to hearing about how the different people in the community were uh, working together um, on this issue. And also involving a diverse range of stakeholders. Like I um, I think I've mentioned this in a previous presentation, um, but a lot of people who do this work do not identify as a digital inclusion practitioner. It's a term we use, those of us who have been doing this work, but the most amount of people that are going to be engaging with this work now, now that this sector has expanded, their very first mission and value of their organization is not going to say like to end the digital divide. It's just that the digital divide is the barrier to them accomplishing their mission and vision. So it could always be um, diversifying the stakeholders that you're bringing to work on this and leveraging their the expertise of different sectors. I don't come from the health sector, but I know telehealth is important um, for the populations I was working with. And so engaging people from those sectors really helped um, me and our program be effective. Next slide. Um, Data-driven approaches. Um, it's important to collect the data. We're not gonna go in here, but just know that data collection will be a component of your work. It's, it's not going away. Um, and identifying the needs and the gaps of, of your program. We're sharing with you a quick snapshot of what will soon be available. There will be a, um, a, an online portal that will be available soon-ish. I don't, I don't know if anybody from HRN wants to give us like a timeline. I, I think y'all did, but I forgot. March, sorry, it's in March. It's right on the slide. So 
in the next couple of weeks, we will probably get access to this portal. You'll be able, it's it's fascinating. You'll be able to go in there and click through the different data about your community. And so you'll want to rely on this information that's readily available to help you um, put together a viable proposal. Next slide. So this is just a reminder um, that the BDO will develop a digital opportunity program, right? So spring 2024, approval of the TDOP, the summers when we um, anticipate the development of the grant program, and then in the fall is when grant applications are expected um, to open. So here's the timeline that we're working towards. So start now so that we can be ready by fall because it's this year's moving fast. All right, next slide. All right, we're gonna pause recording. We've got one, the last, we're gonna spend the last few minutes talking about Next slide, Jordan. So please be signing up for the BDO newsletter. Um, right now, the recordings are av available indefinitely. Um, we are going to find out if, th if that changes. If that changes, we'll send an email out to where the uh, recordings and slides will be available. Thanks, Thaddeus. Um, yeah, and also be forwarding these new letters, <laughs> these newsletters. I, I do all the time. Like something came across my desk the other day. Um, I asked a question. I, I noticed that this was a, an organization working with communities that are really hard to reach. I said, do you know about this program? She said, no, how do I learn more? So I said, you can sign up for this newsletter. And she did. And now she feels like she's super duper plugged in. So we can, one, we can sign up. We can help other people sign up. And it's the best way to like grow this field and keep in contact with each other. And then lastly, next slide. We still have office hours available. So um, those of you who are not heading to net inclusion, um, the entire ILSR team um, you know, is still available. We have some of us are going, but we also have a, a, a large chunk of us that are also remaining behind. And plus we can work around um, it to make it work for people. There's Jordan's email address for the hours. And then uh, as always, if you have questions about anything that we shared with you today, um, you know, please email the digital.opportunity at cpa.texas.gov and be forwarding the page with the TDOP to people in your network so that they can download it and maybe read it and ask you questions about it now that you know more about it. I'm going to give you 15 minutes back to your day, everybody. Thank you.